Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Cray Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Today, Nick Shylock returns to the show. Nick shares his thoughts on the McCartney conspiracy, including the apparent validation of his theory linking Billy Shears to Alistair Crowley, a theory which has been confirmed in the new edition of the memoirs. And so without further ado, here's Nick. Well, folks, we have a great show. Nick Shylock is uh, back with us this evening. And Nick's last show with me was back in June of 2018, and he made quite a splash with my audience. And in that show, you had stated that Alistair Crowley may be related or may be the father of Billy Shepard. Some people may refer to him as Billy Campbell or Billy Shears. We're not going to worry too much about the last name. And when you said that, that was really the first time that that connection was put out there in mass yeah. to the the YouTube community and to the Paul is Dead community. I think I kind of like perfected that theory in the sense of, if you think about it, there wasn't any videos focusing on that particular part of the theory. And when I did that, the Son of Magician, like the King of Cosmania acronym, yep. I thought it was just a theory, and I thought um, maybe it was just them trying to throw us off. I didn't think it was that big of a deal, but I think I thought it was appropriate to talk about it anyway. And my goal was to, it was a theory, but I had evidence to back it up. Like the photo of Sergeant Pepper and the young photo of Crowley, like how m- much him and Bill look alike, and the... King of Cosmania, on the Magician anagram, right, and the um, many Masonic things Bill was putting into the into the Beatles things after '67, and the fact that they kind of hint at it in memoirs just a tiny little bit in the original memoirs, not the new one. And I thought that if I'm going to make a theory, I at least want to have some evidence to back it up for the people that are just going to try to brush it off as if it's nothing at all and that there's no credibility to it. I brought the evidence in to the theory to kind of try to prove. And when you made the video discussing the fact that Bill acknowledged that, and then I get the book and I read it and I find out that they put it into the book. Right. And I was just blown away. Like, I was so excited. I I thought now that my theory was off the ground, now we know it's not just a theory anymore. Whether or not he's the father, they are both in a bloodline that goes with William Wallace. Now that we know what I said in the last episode is not just a theory, now we have to find to the extent of what they are connected. Yeah, so the name Crowley is um, a direct descendant of William Wallace. Uh, In fact, in the book, the Blue Book, uh, Billy tells us that he refers to William Wallace as the Hardy Warrior. And when we take a look at Crowley, which is an Irish surname, the surname has a meaning of descendant of the hard hero or descendant of the hardy warrior. So in the book, Bill uses those exact words. So like you just said, Nick, at the very least, what we can connect here is that he is related to Crowley through bloodlines up through William Wallace. The question that we still need to investigate is whether Crowley was his father. Now, some will say... He's not, or he is. Right. Some will say he's not. Some will say he is. And we could say that because of Crowley's sex magic, that it is possible... Okay, folks, we're just saying it's possible that Billy could be the illegitimate child of Alistair Crowley through one of the sex magic rituals, right? Yeah, and what I like to focus on is the fact that um, around the time Billy was born, Crowley was heavy on that. It was something he did a lot, primarily something he did in London. If you think about it in this certain context of whether or not Bill and Crowley are father and son, it is a definite that they are bloodline yeah. to William Wallace. Two big pieces of evidence that we have that Crowley is Bill's father is the Son of Magician anagram and the fact that around the time of Billy's birth, Crowley was doing these sex rituals in London. And Crowley, before he died, he stated that 20 years after his death, I'm paraphrasing this, so this isn't exactly what he said for anyone who wants to try to fact check me. He said something to this extent that 20 years after he dies, there's going to be a new wave, there's going to be like a new pop culture, it's going to be like big change. Yeah. When he said that, I think he knew that Bill was going to be the one to do that. To the extent of 
what Bill was going to do. I don't know if Alistair Crowley knew. Billy was groomed by Alistair and the Tavstock to be put in place for this power. And I think the bloodline connection has a big deal to do with it. And I think that because Crowley was bloodline with Bill, I think Crowley knew that Bill was going to be the one to do it because it was blood. Yeah, and in the book, he states that Crowley taught him how to do things backwards, right? Yeah. So in the book, he's telling us that he did have direct interaction with Alistair Crowley. So we we now know about the bloodline because of the Hardy Warrior reference. Yeah. And in the book, he states that he was tutored by Alistair Crowley. He was tutored and the bloodline. And I think that comes into a fact that because Crowley himself tutored Bill, Crowley knew Bill was going to be the one to make this societal change 20 years after the death. Sergeant Pepper comes out in 1967 and it says, it was 20 years ago today, Sergeant Pepper taught the band to play. 20 years, not to the exact date, but 20 years prior to Sergeant Pepper, Alistair Crowley dies. When I think of how they put it, they said Sergeant Pepper taught the band to play. I think that's kind of wording for Alistair taught Billy to read backwards, walk backwards, write backwards. They launched Bill into the role of great power to do that. They had to time it just right. And I think Crowley knew that. And I think that's why Crowley said 20 years after I die, this will happen. Not five years, not three years, 20 years. I think there may have been some rituals to do with Billy prior to Crowley's death that may have prophesized that this was going to happen to Billy. Yeah, and we have to put some dates into uh, into perspective here for the audience, Nick. So Billy was born in 1937 because he tells us he's five years older than biological Paul, who was born in 1942. Crowley dies in 1947, so Billy was 10 when Crowley passed away. And then from 1947 to 1967 is the 20 years that you're referring to. Yeah. And if Bill's 10, that means he was doing that his whole childhood. I think that's all he knew. That and music. And I think that was because of Crowley. And one big thing that makes me think that Crowley is Bill's father is the fact that Crowley didn't do this with any other kid that was involved with him. He did that with Billy and just Billy. No other person, maybe the Rolling Stones, but not to the great extent like the Beatles, did what Bill did. I think Crowley knew that that was his blood. And because of that, when this boy became an adult, he would be the one to make that societal change. After reading the new version of memoirs, Tavstock was greatly involved in grooming Billy, not as a goal to replace Paul but to put him in a state of power to where he could make the societal change that Crowley predicted 20 years prior to Sergeant Pepper coming out. Now, also in the book, Nick, it mentions that uh, Billy was in a trauma-based mind control program, and they mentioned that at the age of three, he was in that program. So if we take a look at that, just the trauma-based mind control program, I don't know if it started at age three or that's his earliest memory of being in one of those programs. And then we then know about his connections into Aleister Crowley. We can see, as you're saying, that this whole grooming process was underway, right? Uh, Yeah, it definitely was. I think, I don't think they knew that Paul was going to die and that Bill was going to become Paul. I think they thought that Bill was just going to become in a state of power. And if you think about it, Bill tried putting himself in that state of power. And they did Pepper Potts and they did Phil Ackrell. I think those were Billy's attempts to become famous like the Beatles and put himself in the state of power. But I think the perfect time for him to do that would have been 1967 with the Beatles. And I think there, there was a timeline of events that happened that put him into that position. It didn't, it wasn't just um he knew it was going to happen at this date, at this time. I think there were different plans of how Bill was going to gain power, but because of certain things that were happening around 66, the people that were grooming him knew that if they did this and they put him in Paul's place, he would be able to finally get in that state of power 
that would be able to make a societal change and the Tavstock would be able to do social engineering, LSD, the Monterey Pop Festival, the CIA funding, the counterculture. Right. It was all put in place at the perfect time. So you believe that um, Billy, one way or another, was destined for some position of influence and power. It may have not have been the Beatles. Let's just say it wasn't the Beatles and it wasn't the replacement of Paul McCartney, but he would have wound up someplace, somewhere, yeah. in a powerful position. Let's say that in an alternate timeline where Paul doesn't die, whether or not Paul died or not, Bill would have somehow gotten in that state of power in 67. There's no doubt about it. Whether it be political state of power or a societal state of power, Bill was going to be the one that was going to put in certain things in place of the counterculture and the psychedelic era that kicked off with the Beatles. One way or another, Bill was going to do that. Whether it be Bill do it on his own or with a different band or if he joined the Beatles himself, either way, he was going to be put in that place of power because they were grooming him to do it. It wasn't just him himself trying to put himself in state of power. It was people that had great power right. trying to put him in power. It was people of great power that wanted him to be able to do something. Yeah, they were moving him along. It was. It's kind of like a factory. Think of it like um, how factories, everything, they put everything together and at the end it's shipped out. Think of that like Bill. Bill was put through a mind control program when he was three. Crowley personally taught him how to do things backwards. Crowley dies when Bill's 10. Throughout the time, Bill does um, different music records. And in 1967, 20 years after, it's like a conveyor belt. Think of it like that. And the conveyor belt is the timeline. And by 66, Bill was ready to take on that role of power. Yeah, and, and the book talks a lot, Nick, as you know, about the Illuminati yeah. and the Illuminati structure. And as you said, there were very powerful people that were making decisions to move him along. Yeah, and there's 33 ranks in masonry. By 67, he was somewhere near the 33rd rank. And I think throughout his life before Paul, he was being moved up the ranks by these powerful people. And I think by the time 1967 or end of 1966 was near, they knew that that was the time for him to be put in power. Like they, they knew that there would be no other time that they could have done it. If they, if they had waited another year to try putting Bill in power, it wouldn't have worked the way it ended up happening. The counterculture wouldn't have happened the way it did had it not been for the Tavistock Institute and the masonry and there's three third ranks of masonry 13 ranks of illuminati and then there are how many 20 20 20 more above that there are 20 more that we don't know about and i think those 20 were the ones that were controlling everything involving bill well a lot of it was coming in through the uh, illuminati ranks through the committee of 300 because the book explains that the entire committee of 300 are Illuminati. I have said for, for two and a half years now that Billy is no longer in that Freemasonry uh, structure. He's, he's above and beyond that now. He's in the Illuminated degrees, right? He, he is definitely in the Illuminati because um, by the time of the release of the 2009 version of Memoirs, Billy was 33rd degree. He was the highest degree of Masonry. Now... From the time of 2009 to 2019, so the 10-year span, Bill worked his way into the Illuminati. When he did this new book, the reason he's putting all these things about the Illuminati in it now more than he was in the original is because of the fact that he was in the Illuminati now. Okay, so you think that he's able to disclose more because he's of a higher rank now. Mm -hmm. Now he has all this information about the Illuminati that he didn't before that he could put in the book. And... Now he was put in a place of power in the Illuminati. Now he knows all these things, and he's integrating them into the new version of memoirs. I have said that after reading the Blue Book, which I found to be extremely informative, that it is a darker book than the first yeah. edition, the Red Book. 
it's a more disturbing book, and I had trouble getting through the book. There was times in the book where, like, I honestly it kept me up at night because it kind of got gruesome, gruesome in the context of very dark and sinister. Yeah, the occult aspects of it, right? Yeah, the esoteric aspect of it that we know about. And now we know Bill was in the esoteric, but we never knew till now the extent yeah. of it. We didn't know till now that Bill was taught personally by Crowley. We didn't know that. And we didn't know he was in a mind control program. Yeah, we didn't know he was in the mind control program at the age of three. And I think now that we know these, we know that there's a darker concept to what actually happened to Paul. There's a darker meaning behind why Paul died. All right. So maybe we should talk about that a little bit. I know you and I spoke before the show, and, and you had said that uh, the death of Paul McCartney was not an accident. Yeah. I, 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 saw, I believed it was an accident around the time of our last interview, but now I don't. What made you change your mind? From the time we did that interview to now, I watched a movie called The Walrus. Great movie. It's on YouTube. It's by... Um, James Paul 66, he he created it. Um, just look up The Walrus, Paul is Dead, and it's a movie. And if you look in the timeline of things that were actually happening in the in real life, it added up. Paul was talking with Mark Lane about a Mark Lane's book that contradicted the Warren Report and said stated that JFK's death was an inside job by the American people and that Oswald was just a patsy. Now, Paul offered to do a score for this movie. It ended up never coming out, but it was going to basically contradict the Warren report. And Paul was getting very involved with the JFK conspiracy. And I think the people that were behind covering it up didn't want it to come out. And when the quote-unquote moped accident happened, I think that wasn't an accident. That that was Paul's warning. Well, he I think he was beat up, kidnapped and beat up by the people involved in this to as a warning of keep quiet or we're going to do to you what happened to JFK. At that point, Paul, by getting involved with the people involved with the JFK conspiracy and Mark Lane, he put himself in a situation where the Illuminati and the people grooming Bill were able to manipulate his situation into Bill becoming Paul. And why I say this is because Paul puts himself, he causes himself to be targeted by the fact that he's getting involved with the JFK conspiracy. Okay. And I think because of the fact that he was a Beatle and he was so famous that if he had said something, it would have gone worldwide. The people covering it up didn't want that. So I think the moped accent was like a warning. But I think what happened was is when he put himself in the position of being targeted, let, okay, let's think about it in this context. If Bill replaced Paul, Paul was dead. Not only would that situation work for the people covering up JFK's death, it would also work for the people trying to put Bill in power. And you have to think about it. At this point, I'm pretty sure like the people covering this up wanted Paul dead if they were trying to cover this up. So there were two benefits to him being taken out. There were benefits. Paul dying, there was an ulterior motive of Paul's death. And people, a lot of people would assume that the overall motive was for Paul to be silenced because of what he wanted to say about the JFK conspiracy. And I think it is that, but that's only half the story. Now, the Illuminati and Tavstock, they see that Paul's a target. They're at the height of their fame at this time. And Tavistock sees that Paul is a target now by the people coming up JFK and that there is a double benefit. They were able to see that situation and manipulate it. And I think the people covering up JFK's death knew that that was going to happen. I think they knew about the Tavistock. I think the Tavistock went to them and said, here's what's going to happen. We both win either way. And they said, okay. So Paul's death was a sacrifice and a cover up. So. Bill looked enough like Paul, and he sounded enough like Paul. He was the man of a thousand voices. He can change his voice. He was able to become Paul. They knew that. They were able to manipulate the fact that he could imitate Paul like no one else could. So I think when Paul died, 
not only did the people covering up the JFK conspiracy get what they want by the silence of Paul McCartney, suppressing Paul McCartney's voice in the matter, the Tavistock Institute, the Illuminati, and the people grooming Bill also got what they want because they were able to put Bill in a state of power because of Paul's fame at the time. They could push him in that state of power and manipulate the situation to where now that Paul's dead and Bill's taking his place, Bill could have the power to make a big societal change. And this was all happening 20 years after Crowley's death. And I think this not only was, this was a cover-up, this was a sacrifice, this was something that was prophesized, because this happened 20 years after Crowley's death. They knew they could manipulate a, a situation, so they did. And because of it, we lost one of the greatest artists of all time. But at what cost? So, Nick, let me ask you this then. In the book, it, it says that biological Paul McCarty and John Lennon entered into a satanic pact. In other words, there was a satanic ritual that took place. And uh, Memoirs explains that the pact was about the band achieving great success at any cost, including they would give their lives for the success of the band, right? Yeah. So the book talks about this, and this is one of the dark parts of the book because there's a lot of people out there that researchers and other folks looking into Paul is Dead that want to believe that the Beatles were never involved in this type of thing, that they did not have these satanic influences. But the book clearly states that this ritual took place and that there were handlers involved to make sure that the ritual went down properly. I think that pact happened in 65 because that's the first time we see something esoteric from the Beatles and the help cover with the they're doing from the things in Crowley's book the poses I think it started in 65 and at that point they were already famous but they wanted more fame they wanted to become the greatest because in 64 63 they were competing with the Rolling Stones so you think it was as late as 65. See, I think it was earlier. I think it was back probably around 1962 or so, but it's okay. You think it, it was might later. Have been 62. It might have been like the Meet the Beatles because like the half-shaded face. It might have been then. Besides that, it, it got really heavy in 65. So I think there's something that happened in 65 that greatly influenced the Beatles. And this is when Bill like started meeting them. It's an obvious point that Bill knew the Beatles prior to Paul's death. Well, it says that in the book. It says that when he was with the diplomats, uh, they did, um, I guess they opened for the Beatles back in 1962 or something, and they shared the same uh, dressing room and so on. So, yeah, he was he was familiar with and interacting with the Beatles back as early as 1962, according to the book. I'm going to say Paul may have had a car crash that was purposely caused, or he may have been shot and his body taken to a car. In my personal opinion, I think a car was waiting for Paul and they ran him off the road on purpose. That's what I think happened. But I think the reason the Beatles, let's, it could have been the Stones. They could have put Bill with the Stones. And Bill could have done the same thing he did with the Beatles. But I think the reason it was the Beatles is because Bill knew them prior to Paul's death, and they made that pact with Satan. And I think that it started a timeline of events that put Bill in a place of power. The book also explains that a satanic ritual is only a satanic ritual when the death is not an accident. In other words, uh, the death has to be intentionally put in play. So what you're saying here is that the intentional put in play, if it was a car accident, was premeditated. In The Walrus, how it happened was there was a car accident. Paul survived the car accident. They kidnapped Paul. They beat him. They killed him. They pull them in the car, light the car on fire. That's what happened in the walrus. What I think happened is they waited for Paul when he left uh, Abbey Road that night. And I think they were following him. And where the crash apparently took place, the road kind of makes a triangle. If you if you go on Google Maps and you put the road in, I think the name's in um, – it's in the book, but the, it's also in the Magical Mystery Tour they read. 10 miles north on the Dewsbury Road. I think that's where it happened because I hint that that's where it happened a lot. And um, if you put that in the Google map, either 
directly where that road is or near where that road is, there's like a road that makes a triangle intersection. I think they had a plot to run Paul off the road and into a pole. Okay, and then make sure that I guess they finished him off if the crash didn't kill him, right? The crash didn't kill him. They finished him off. And it's interesting you said that the intersection there is a triangle because that's the whole pyramid symbolism again, right? So I, I didn't realize that. I didn't know that that was a uh, – the road was designed in a triangular shape. So that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so what this says that, uh, you know, this is part of the dark stuff that we're talking about. I also want to let the audience know that, you know, when Nick's talking about the JFK assassination in Mark Lane's book and biological Paul wanting to get involved, writing the score to a potential movie or documentary that Mark Lane was going to do, that is not in memoirs. So uh, I'm saying that so we yeah. were able to delineate between what's in the book and what is not. The JFK thing, that was a public thing that happened. It's not like you're going to read memoirs and it's just going to be a theory that that happened. No, that happened because it was talked about in interviews and it was it was definitely known that Paul was trying to get involved. So it that wasn't that's not a theory that Paul wanted to get involved. That's a fact. I think there was a double benefit for the people covering JFK's murder and the people grooming Bill. There was there was a benefit for both of them if Paul died. Let me ask you this question, Nick, because this comes up a lot when people accuse memoirs of being disinformation or all fiction. How do you respond to that? What's your take on that? I think most of the people I'd say that are people that haven't read the book or people that want to make theories and then claim their theories as fact without any evidence to back it up. And then anything besides what they say is false automatically. My take on it is that the book is so loaded up, so loaded up with so many details. And I want to call out a couple of things here for those folks out there that have uh, heard those statements being made about the book being disinformation. The first thing we have to understand is that if the book were disinformation or it was completely fiction, then Tommy Harriet, Nick, yeah. in my opinion, would be up to his eyeballs in lawsuits, yeah. right? The, a bill would have sued him for slander. Or the people that were families with the people talking about in the book would have sued for slander. I think there's things in the book that only Bill himself would know. You can't make that up. That's not something that can just be made up. Well, here's the other thing, too, that uh, a lot of folks don't understand, is that in order to use lyrics in a book, you can't just write a book and use lyrics. You have to license it. Right. You have to go get permission to use those lyrics. Otherwise, you are in violation of, uh, of copyright laws. The book is loaded up with lyrics, and not just Beatle lyrics. It's loaded up with lyrics from The Who, yeah. The Rolling Stones, Elton John. Uh, I would just like to say this. I put a video up immediately after I uploaded it. I got like 30 plus copyright strikes. The people that were behind the creation of that book were given permission to use the information and lyrics in the book. You can't just put lyrics in the book. Not only would have they, they would have been sued for slander, copyright infringement. The new edition of the book would have never been made if the book wasn't real. Because the people suing wouldn't have allowed it to be made. Well, the forward was written by Gregory Paul Martin, who's the oldest son yeah. of uh, George Martin. Didn't he also do the audiobook? Yes, he did the audiobook. I That's recognize right. that voice. I'm like, uh, yeah, I know that voice somewhere. So, like, yeah, even people that were involved with the Beatles were involved with the book. If you think that the book is false, Gregory Martin would not have been part of that project at all. He would have not wanted to be part of that project. He would have sued for them using his name in the project and crediting the audiobook to him. He would have sued, but he didn't. Yeah, it's, it's the book is definitely a process of disclosure that's taking place. And, uh, and the only reason why I bring this up is because I get asked this question a lot, and it gets to be a little frustrating after a while because, uh, as you said, when they do make these comments, it is clear that they haven't read the book. Or if they did read the book, they did not read it objectively, right? They read the book subjectively, which meant that they read it with the mindset that they were going to debunk it. Yeah. In order to be able to process the information put in that book, you have to be able to go in with an open mind. You can't just go in with a negative attitude because otherwise you're not going to get anywhere with research. And I want to bring up the toxic, 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 toxic Facebook community surrounding Paul is dead because I have been in groups where if you post something that has evidence and it's credible 
but the person that's the admin doesn't agree with it, it will be deleted. And if you post something that the admin doesn't delete, there will be so many people that have these outrageous, almost childlike arguments over it. And that doesn't get anywhere in research. You can't move forward like that. I don't spend any time on those on those pages. I, I have been invited to join and participate, but I don't um, I don't participate in them. Um, the reason is is because I want to stay focused on my research, and I have a lot of people who follow the research that I'm doing that are connected into me that are also researchers, and we don't do the research and share information through Facebook Paul is dead pages or through forums. It's direct communication, right? We have each other's emails or we will Skype each other and we will share information that way. So we don't do it through social media. I mean, that's how, that's how I work it, Nick. So, but I, I understand, I understand where you're coming from that it can be toxic and there are people out there that if they don't agree with you, agree with you, or if you're not rowing the boat where they're rowing the boat, they will remove your comments. They will remove your posts. And that's not right. There was one person I want to publicly say who did it. He blocked me because I made a comment saying that's not correct. And I fact checked what she was saying and I was blocked. That's the kind of stuff that goes on. I think you've talked about it enough in your other videos. Yeah, I did one video, which was uh, satire, which uh, I, I pointed it out. And a lot of people obviously got it. So I guess, you know, we'll just leave it there. It's unfortunate that that kind of dialogue or lack of dialogue, I should say, or lack of civil discourse takes place, but it does. I mean, it's just a, a fact of life. Yeah. And it's, it's what, uh, you know, well, I, I was going to say it's what we have to deal with, but we really don't have to deal with it because if we just avoid those types of forms, we won't have to deal with it. We just do our own thing. You could just like be able to move on and do your own research without having to go by the guidelines of what arrogant people think. Speaking of arrogance, I'd like to go into the fact that Bill's less arrogant in the new version memoirs. I found the tone to be very different also, Nick. I, he, he seems to have toned it down, right? I think that's two reasons. One, because the original was released in 2009. They were originally going to reveal the truth in 2012, but they didn't. And the other reason being because of his new state of power. Well, I think it was one of those things too, Nick, where in the first book, Almost everybody that I spoke to who read the Red Book, the first edition, the 9-9-2009 version, came away saying, boy, he sounds like a real jerk. Yeah. Yeah, he just sounds very full of himself, and very self-absorbed. And, and in the meantime, in the book, he's telling us to get to know him. And so, but the way he presented himself was one of those situations where you're thinking to yourself, I don't really want to know you. <laughs> I think the reason he was like that was because of the fact that because he was going to reveal the truth in 2012, he wanted people to be able to know the actual creator behind the songs. Yeah. I think the way he went about it wasn't the right way to go about it. And I think he knew that updating the book. So yeah, there's a whole different tone in the book. I was more happy with the new version of the book than I was with the old. I mean, I like, I like the original book. I just think the new version of the book is just, it's worth a read Yeah. for people that were not too happy with the original. It has a lot more information. The blue book really divulges a lot of a lot of detail. The, the red book did too, but he, he really goes into. He goes in. He does not. He deep dives. He doesn't, he doesn't hesitate in telling you the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And then in the first book, you know, his, his approach was. Being cryptic. Cryptic and too self-absorbed, right? Yeah. He was really kind of loving himself. And then in the blue book, it's darker. There's a lot more details, a deeper dive, like I said, but he toned down his the way he presented it. It was good. It was easier to read that way than it was with the red book. Speaking of the new information in the book, I want to talk about the Phil Ackrell and Vivian Stanchel, the new information that was given about them. Yep. I want to talk about the fact Forensic evidence on, on it, pictures of Viv without the mustache, hell of a lot like James McCartney. And the photo of him without the mustache looks like Phil Ackrell with latex. And he goes more into how they did that in the book. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm going to do a, a video on the whole 
uh, substantial actual piece of it because there's still a lot of people that don't see it. So interesting. Well, the thing is, the people that don't see it are people that, again, many of them, I'm not going to say all of them, but many of them haven't read the book because if you read the book, he explains exactly how it worked. Yeah, there was many procedures that were done. There was procedures to look like Paul. Then they did fillers, and after the fillers, they knew they couldn't go any further with it, so they did latex. That's why Vivian looks different after a certain point. When Bill couldn't be Paul, someone else was. Just like how when Bill couldn't be Vivian, because he can't be two people at once, someone would fill in. And I think that's why sometimes you'd see Vivian with blonde hair. Sometimes you'd see him with red. Sometimes you'd see him with a more narrow face. Sometimes you'd see him with a very round face. Sometimes his face would look real. Sometimes his face would look fake. You can never tell who was Bill because it was always it was a constant change. So in the book, it explains that um, there were two Vivians. There was I call Street Vivian. And this was an actor that was hired by Billy to play the part of Vivian Stanshall so that the McCartney character and the Stanshall character can both coexist. And the Street Viv, he was also a musician. He was uh, doing videos, a lot of the videos that you see of uh, Vivian Stanshall when he's not with the Bonzo Dog Band is Street Viv. Uh, Ginger Geezer, like the last 1995 appearance before his death, like that's definitely not Bill. Right, right. So, so there was two. So, and... So the, the Vivian Stanshaw that Bill played was the Vivian Stanshaw that played with the Bonzo Dog Band, right? Yeah. And the Vivian that didn't play with the Bonzo Dog Band was Street Vivian Stanshaw. Yeah. And Bill had Street Vivian Stanshaw on his payroll. Bill had put him into play because the character Vivian Stanshaw is not a real person. He is a character that was invented by Billy Shepard. Yeah, and I, I like to point out one thing. Um, there's the I'm an Urban Spaceman video. Yeah. Where Bill has the Sgt. Pepper flu in. What's the lead singer? I forgot his name now. You, you talk about Neil Innes? Neil Innes. I was, I was forgetting his last name, but his name is Neil Innes says, I don't exist. And then he looks at Vivian. Right. That's right. Yeah, there's the clues there, too. He, like, smiled at him like he knew that what they were talking about. Right. And it's the same thing with, with Phil Ackrell. Bill Ackrell, I think there's a street Phil. Yeah, well, what happened with, yeah, I, I believe it's the same template. It was like, I think in the 80s, 90s, when people were finding out about Phil being Bill, I think they put the street Bill in, Phil in for those videos you see of them as kind of a cover-up saying no. From the early 60s to then, no one saw Phil, barely. Right. And I think that was kind of a way for them to de try to try to debunk the fact that Phil was Bill. By putting in a street fill. Phil Ackrell basically disappeared, Nick, for 20 years, right? Yeah. There was one photo of him that I could find. I think I sent it to you a very long time ago. It was the photo of Phil with a mustache looking like Vivian with dark hair. There was one photo of him between the 1990 and 1980 and the early 60s. Yeah, and then I get sent video clips of Phil Ackrell well, allegedly Phil Ackrell playing in the 1980s and 1990s at these small venues and people wanting to argue with me that, see, there he is. How could he be? Uh, that's not That's him. not him. That's not him. It's exactly right. Right. That's somebody else playing the character of Phil Ackrell. That is not the same person from 20 or 30 years earlier. The model is this, folks. This is how they do it. I'm going to do an entire presentation on this. They had a street version of McCartney and they had a performer musician version of McCarty. The, the performing musician was Billy. The street version was a an actor that was uh, in place for public consumption. Okay? So this allowed Billy to be able to go do other things because they had a street version of Paul McCartney walking around. They used the same exact template for Vivian Stanshall. It was a street Paul that went, you know, the photographs, the paparazzi, but and then there's the real Bill Paul, who did the tours in the studio. Right. And the, writing music. Yeah, and writing music. And that's why sometimes Bill will contradict himself. Like, he'll say one thing in one interview, and then Shri Paul will say something in another interview that contradicts what Bill said. That's the model, uh, Nick, and I'm glad that you understand it. And it's actually, when you think about it, it's very simple. It's a very simple formula that they used. 
highly effective yeah. having two different versions. Now, that also doesn't mean that they were the only two paging in and out, right? We know that they were the two primary, but there were other players and characters flowing in and out. I think we went over in the original interview how we talked about Spencer Davis I brought up. I brought up um, Harry Nelson. There was a lot of other people. Yeah. The, the thing is, is that people underestimate the the latex. They underestimate the cosmetics. Because this was like ahead of its time latex. The latex that they do in movies now, where it's like perfect, it's like that the back then. Because they had access to that. And we have plenty of proof, Nick, of Billy using latex as the McCartney character. I have these videos up on my channel. Before you do the final edit, I will find that photo by tomorrow night of the latex mold. They did mold of Paul McCartney's face. Yeah, that would be great. To make latex. And that's like undeniable evidence that latex, no matter what context you want to say it was used, was used. And I will have that to you by tomorrow, and you could put it in this video so people could see. Because I feel like a lot of people haven't seen that photo. I, have you, I don't even know if you've seen that photo. I screenshot that photo and I put it in the Facebook thing, but uh, someone removed it. No, of course, because it didn't fit their narrative, right? Didn't. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to do a full presentation on uh, Vivian Stanshall and Phil Akrolnik, and uh, we'll get that out there so people can really understand how it all worked. Is there anything else, Nick, that you'd like to cover before we head out here? I want to quickly talk about, okay, so I have it with me. It's called Paul McCartney Spies Like Us. In the music video, Paul is wearing a mask, and he takes off this mask and reveals himself as Paul. And I think that's a good clue to the fact that there was latex involved. And another thing is um, apparently on September 11th, there was a news report claiming that Paul McCartney had been in a fatal accident. More details at 11. Back in 1966? Yeah, like the night off. And I talked, Yeah. because I have some family members that were alive around this time, and I talked to one of some of them, and one of them claimed they saw this. And they said that they waited all night for the story because it said fatal, Paul McCartney involved in the fatal accident, more news at 11. They wait till 11, no news story at all. Yeah, there's a number of people that uh, recall that story and uh, remember hearing that. Remember in the memoirs where Bill talks about how there was a, a news reporter that was about to tell yeah. the story, but they paid him off. I think that's what it was. It was uh, Sam, the uh, well, they gave him the name of Sam. He was the uh, the reporter that was pressing the issue, and then they paid him off. Yeah, yeah, I think that's why the news story like never came out. Well, do you have the clip of him taking the mask off? It's in the uh, intro of the Spies Like Us music video. He walks in the studio and he's like wearing um. Okay. He's wearing this like silly mask, and it's mid odd latex, and he like rips it off and reveals it as Paul McCartney. All right, I'm going to uh, go look for it. I'll put it in the show so that people can take a look at it because that's symbolic. Of yeah, what's that's going symbolic. On. And another video is um the music video for Paul McCartney coming up. There are multiple Pauls in that video. There are some that are right-handed. They some of them have different ears. And I think that was also symbolic of the fact that there was more than one Paul. Yeah. It's also interesting to point out the fact that I Am A Phony is operating on more than one channel, YouTube channel. There are many other channels that is run by I'm a I Am A Phony. So for people that think I Am A Phony is dead because the original I Am A Phony channel hasn't uploaded a video in a year, there are more channels that are run by I Am A Phony that have been recently posting videos. These other channels are I Am I, I Was, Shears, like I Was in, in the Crowley book. There's AR3RA. There's one called Neil Aspinall. If you go to the I'm a Phone channel, and you know how like sometimes channels will have the thing where you can click the word channels and they'll have a list of channels? Yeah. If you go to I'm a Phone and you do that, there's all these other channels. And there's a video on one of these channels called Twin Pepper, and they talk about even prior to Paul's death, the Beatles were using doubles. Oh, yeah. That was stated in memoirs that, you know, that there were uh, doubles for all of the Beatles since the very beginning. Yeah, and there was also a thing that Paul McCartney's, he had two Sgt. Pepper records that were stolen from his home, and 
if you played the two records simultaneously, there are clues that the Beatles put in. And it's only on those two records. And I am a phony possession of those two records. And deep, deep in the internet, I, it's even hard for me to find it sometimes because I have, I'll find it and then I'll, a few days later, I'll have trouble getting back to it. There was an audio thing they put where they recorded, they took an audio recorder and they recorded the two albums and you could play them both side by side. Okay. And backwards. And there's, and they're called the Twin Peppers. That is the, the clues that were never came out publicly. Those are the clues that you really have to hunt for. I mean, do you have a link for any of this or? Yeah, I, I have a link for the video called Twin Peppers and it was even stated in, one of the Beatles book magazines Yeah. that Paul had had two copies of Sgt. Pepper stolen from his home. Okay. Well, send send me that link, and I'll put it in the description box so that our listening audience can uh, click on it and go take yeah. a look. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a cryptic video, but I feel in that video they kind of get to the point. Okay. Like, the Twin Peppers was about the doubles and the records that were stolen. And they don't try to add in all this nonsense and make you look for the truth they tell you straight up this is what happened but in a cryptic way but to a way where even though it's cryptic you will understand it immediately well that's good because all that other cryptic stuff that's out there where you have to solve like a million piece puzzle gets to be annoying after a while <laughs> like you have to like pause it just the right moment to see a photo right. <laughs> yeah. and, like it, all these photos keep flashing in and out it's like giving me a, a multi-seizure <laughs> like all right, Nick, look, I, it was a great discussion, yeah. and uh, I'm so glad that you came back on this show and to talk about this, and um, I'm going to have the show out as soon as I can, maybe within two weeks, and when I do, I'll send a copy to you, and you know, feel free to upload it to your YouTube channel, yeah. and anytime you want to come back and talk about this or anything else, maybe we could talk about guitar repairs. You were telling me. To get yeah, into that. I, I um, have been working a lot of on like, I've been using your videos as like a guideline on how to like work, work with the guitars. And then um, Good. I'm, I plan on doing a complete makeover of my one guitar and adding like a bunch of better things to it. Yeah. Cause I, I think like what they put in that guitar wasn't good enough. Like I think that even the tone, like I want to get a better tone arm for that, like a better, like, um, the action on that guitar, unlike the Gibson I have, it's like where the little screws that come up, you can align it in a certain way, and like the screws just fall out of it, and I like have to constantly repair it. So I'm gonna even put in like a whole new bridge. Okay, all right. So okay, so you having problems with the bridge? Yeah. All right. Well, what you can do is you can uh, Skype me, show me the guitar, and uh, I'll explain to you, you know, if you need help what it is that we need to do. Right. And send me pictures of those guitars, Nick, and I'll put them in the show so people can see what your uh, your axes look like. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll show you a photo of the – I have another guitar that's not here right now. It's at my friend's house because he has, like, the workshop I told you about. I'll show you the in-progress guitar that we have going on. It's going to be um a, a red with a tint of black, kind of like a cheetah look, and it's okay. going to be a Gibson, like the 1968 Gibson that George Harrison had. And we're gonna put, we're gonna try installing um, a whammy bar in it. We're gonna add a uh, lock and tuners. Okay, very good. It's gonna be great. We're gonna try to put in a double pickup, so that that'll be fun. I'm gonna have to like. It's drill. good that you're doing that type of work. Yeah, I'm gonna have to like drill in a bunch of holes throughout the guitar. Don't be afraid, man. Just go, go for it. Go for the gusto. <laughs> That's how you learn. If it doesn't work, I mean, he he knows how to build. He knows like how to actually like, take like trees from wood and like build them because like he does that a lot so like we could just build a new body for the guitar so it's no big deal good all right nick uh again it's so uh, it's really good to talk to you and uh you come back anytime okay all right thank you all right nick bye-bye now bye and that concludes another sage or Quay interview and i hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as i did links to my guests websites and social media are listed in the description box below and as always, I would like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can find all my social media and web links by visiting my hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to check out my music and album releases. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone with the next show. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.
Change the world.